looking at the building as such and how it sat within the land, the cultural sort of landscape. I guess Linda will sort of really be taking us inside the building and thinking about what the building was trying to do and trying to achieve. Um, Dr Linda Young is a senior lecturer in cultural heritage and museum studies at Deakin University, so has travelled all the way from Melbourne to be here with us today, which is um, fantastic. Um, and I first came across Linda um, uh, uh, when researching this project, and I'd encourage you all to um, jump online to the ABC, um, it was an eShop program, um, and you were the central narrative of this eShop program. Um, and I have to say that if history was um, talked about in such an amazing way as you sort of captured the Garden Palace, I might have become a historian. Um, so it's an enormous pleasure to have you here. Um, and um, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. <laughs> you. Doesn't he say the nicest things? <laughs> Look, I'd like to acknowledge the Kadikul people, the people of this land that now we call Sydney. And thank you, Uncle Chika, for welcoming us to the place. Uh, I'd also just like to mention that you might notice my hands shaking. Now, it's not extreme anxiety, and I wasn't on the Terps last night, uh, and it's not incipient Parkinson's. It's a condition known as benign essential tremor. But, you know, it's, it's cool. <laughs> I, I know a lot about the Sydney International Exhibition, uh, thank, thanks to both an honours and a master's thesis that I, I wrote about it. Uh, and in fact, it connected me to the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences uh, via its, contemporary, uh, its centenary exhibition about the exhibition that the uh, museum held in 1979. I, I worked as a volunteer on that and it led to a job at the museum, as is often the case. Uh, I must say about that that I'm just appalled at the, the current state government effort to move the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, yeah, from, from the inner city. It's just the most, the most appalling uh, throwing out of, of history. And I'm so glad to see that many people here today are members of the the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences resistance. All strength to you. <laughs> uh, I was uh, working at the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences in 1982, this end, and uh, I, I organised a commemorative celebration of the fire in uh, the Garden Palace fire in that year. Uh, it was, of course, a firework. Uh, it was a, a firework outline of the building that was hung on the, the iron fence of the Botanic Gardens in Macquarie Street. And it was accompanied by a rendition of the exhibition Cantata, which I, I roused up uh, members of SUMS, the Sydney Uni Musical Society, to, to sing. We had an electric piano out there. Now, you had to know that, that those, the early 80s was a period of drought in New South Wales. And the very evening that we got going, uh, the drought broke. <laughs> And the firework actually fizzled. <laughs> In fact, the, the, um, the pianist on an electric keyboard nearly got electrocuted. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was another kind of disaster. <laughs> uh, so we dashed across the road to the RAHS and uh, drank, drank away our, our uh, regrets. But I, I do trust that the luck of the Garden Palace has changed for Jonathan's next uh, installation. <laughs> uh, I've started with the Crystal Palace here. Uh, this is where, where the whole exhibition movement began, the great exhibition. We can now look at it as a turning point in world history, the peak of Britain's power and influence. The Great Exhibition generated new currents in the economy, society and public culture around the globe. On one level, it was a spectacular festival of industry, manufacturing, trade, marketing, consumerism, the basis of British wealth. On another level, it was a massive spectacle of nationalism, of British power, boosted by its tribes of colonies and contrasted by the willing participation of other nations in the old world and the new world, constituting an early manifestation of calculated global vision. In yet another dimension, 
the Great Exhibition was an unprecedented mass public event, attracting crowds of visitors, rich, middling, relatively poor people, all of whom behaved themselves very well, somewhat to the surprise of the organisers, because it was so rare to have this many common people gathered together. I want to step through each of these points because they established the character of the species of Great Exhibition, which subsequently spread around the world, including Australia, beginning in Sydney. How like England we can be. This line from the cantata, you might have heard the cantata in the Sydney Uni Musical Society rendition playing as you came in. Uh, this line says it all for me. Uh, the full line is, mighty nations, let them see, uh, let them view, sons of generous sires in you. Mighty nations, let them see how like England we can be. The, the model of exhibition philosophy, structure, appurtenances, style, events, that was established by the Great Exhibition was the guide of the organising committee for the Sydney International Exhibition. And so I begin with a look back to the Great Exhibition. The Great Exhibition presented the tremendous scope of British industrial mass production. Uh, but on the whole, at the consumer end rather than the production end. Britain as the factory of the world was on display in the Crystal Palace and it was depicted, as you see here, as an object of calm, informed interest uh, by exhibition visitors. The significance of British manufacturing in the exhibition context was not just the technology which was celebrated or the appalling conditions of factory labour, which of course was utterly suppressed, not mentioned, the outstanding novelty of the exhibition was its celebration of selling and concomitantly of buying the products of industry. What was displayed in the Crystal Palace was the top of the, uh, the, top of the range of industrially manufactured goods, the super luxury goods, sometimes the virtuoso one-off manufactured goods that were made specially for show. Meanwhile, the huge bulk of industrial production was actually in cheaper ranges, which the middling and even the relatively poor could afford. The genius of mass production was that uh, it could manufacture what used to be exclusive luxuries in, in cheaper versions at many price points, so that many more people were able to afford them. In this, we can see the beginnings of popular consumerism, the ability to buy and the availability of vast quantities of stuff to buy. Textiles make a great example. Cotton textiles were the original British mass-produced goods of the Industrial Revolution and they remained a huge industry until uh, well, World War I. There is an argument in economic history that the impact of working class consumption of relatively small quantities of fabric for basic comforts like bed sheets and mats and even curtains and tablecloths, that this was an important example of the process of luxuries being turned into the decencies of life and what used to be decencies became necessities. The conjunction of even a small sliver of disposable income and the availability of consumer goods was changing the standard of living for people of all classes in Britain. And not just their standard of living, but their expectations and their values. Uh, since the, economy, the industrial economy required not just factory workers, but, a whole, but whole echelons of bookkeepers, managers, bankers, uh, it created growing markets in the new middle class with ever increasing levels of disposable income. All these people, including industrial uh, workers who earned just above necessity, all these people now had some money to spend on personal and domestic goods and all of them were absolutely inspired by the great exhibition. 
So what was on show at the Great Exhibition was first and foremost an orgy of marketing. The exhibition wasn't a shop as such, but it displayed what individual consumers might dream of buying, if not now, then someday. This slight degree of separation between consumerist desire and outright commerce enabled an elaborate display of ideals, presenting showpieces as if they're available to anyone and everyone. It separated these wonderful goods from the common sphere of trade and invited visitors to dream with just enough knowledge that they may well be able to afford something like this. And with the flattering suggestion that they're already capable of appreciating the quality and artistry of these goodies. This discourse of beauty and fineness as evidence of personal taste and refinement and even a, a tinge of morality, merged intricately but inexplicitly with the world of consumer goods. It employed a spectacular visual rhetoric of desirable products, realised by display in profusion and in supersize. Uh, the, the exhibition aesthetic was, was humongous piles of goods, uh, exquisitely arranged specimens, uh, gigantic examples made specifically for show. Today we'd call this kind of exhibition curated to indicate the degree of mindful, purposeful presentation focused on impressing visitors, which was the polite name for hundreds of thousands of potential customers. All this was set in an amazingly large, bright, advanced technology structure decked with luxurious fittings and decor, the whole evidencing the wonders of the modern world. It wasn't just a rhetoric, but an aesthetic of democratising consumerism. And here we can see the origins, not only of the luxury department store, and, uh, but also of the museum. <laughs> the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, to be precise. In these ways, the Great Exhibition exemplified the new age, new values. The Great Exhibition presaged the consumerist future much more truly than its progenitor, uh, the good Prince Albert, could possibly have dreamed. The Great Exhibition was a fantastic success and set off a firecracker string of similar international exhibitions around the world because every modern in industrial nation and every would-be modern colonial or ex-colonial nation could see that the huge trade exhibition was a stroke of genius in nationalist display. This was showing off in the name of progress, skill, ingenuity, what we would call today modernity, though that concept uh, didn't, well, was not used as such uh, in the late 19th century. In one huge gesture, these exhibitions could claim productive progress. I have a feeling I didn't mean to come to that. <laughs> in one huge gesture, these exhibitions could claim in productive progress, make vibrant patriotic statements, mobilise the metropolis, the countryside, the colonies, and claim a national mantle of good taste and advanced civilization. In short, exhibitions raised the profiles of an a nation's international influence. An exhibition approximated, I did, I, I should have gone on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I must have skimmed very fast through those. It's what comes of trying to be smart without using the technology with knowledge. An exhibition approximated the whole world under one roof via the arrangement of exhibition displays in national courts, with the old world at one end of the building and the new world at the other end of the building, uh, which is a whole new trope of hum harmonious internationalism constructed on the foundations of trade, which probably still sounds familiar if you think about the EU and the Trans-Pacific um, uh, Potential Agreement. And so at last we shift to Sydney in 1879. I'm going to contrast the Sydney International Exhibition vision and spectacle with the model established by the Great Exhibition. 
The Sydney exhibition was certainly a public festival of industrial productivity, trade, marketing and consumerism, and it was also a glorious performance of colonial nationalism. The first necessity was a splendid building surrounded by further uh, outbuildings for exhibits of agricultural produce, machinery, art, restaurants and other concession holders, photographers. Uh, we saw some of them in, in Peter's talk. Exhibition, uh, exhibition buildings had developed into a specific genre since the Crystal Palace, a mixture of cathedral and warehouse with a touch of gigantic railway station. Demonstrating industrial productivity was actually a big ask for New South Wales, whose economy was overwhelmingly agricultural, uh, in, still in the late 19th century. But modern technology was absolutely vital for the look and feel of an international exhibition. So here, in the, the great nave of the Garden Palace, we see European exhibits of iron and steel manufacture. Uh, this, the tall black column is a column of steel, Belgian steel, and the curly one that's lower down is, is a gigantic iron spring. These, these ones were from the German and Belgian courts. There was, there was stuff like thick iron plate for armaments, uh, this is a reminder of the great anxiety about potential Russian incursions uh, on British colonies. So uh, but German, Belgian, French and British heavy industry were very welcome in New South Wales. Uh, still, the most prominent technology was outside the Garden Palace. The first steam-powered tram in the colony, which ran along Macquarie Street with a stop at the exhibition, uh, introduced many visitors to the exhibition. Inside the Garden Palace was one of the first lifts in the colony. It was available to whisk paying, paying uh, customers up the North Tower to a chamber uh, tastefully got up by a London furniture exhibitor from which visitors could take in the harbour in exclusive comfort. Uh, the lift manufacturer actually managed to cover all his costs from the admission charges to ride in his lift. You know, that's the enterprise we need to see, is it? User pays. <laughs> the fact is that technology in the Australian colonies was dedicated to agriculture, as demonstrated here in the machinery annex outside the Garden Palace. I, I was looking at this, noting the persistent figure in exhibition illustrations of visitors who were so keenly interested in the material uh, on display that they're overwhelmingly depicted from behind, focusing their own and the viewer's eye on the exhibits. Both men and women are shown in high fashion dress, but this particular view in a colonial court of the machinery annex depicts countrymen. I don't think we can call them uh, bushmen. They're a bit too well dressed for that. They're the ones who are indicated by not wearing top hats or bowler hats, but wide brimmed hats, wider wakes, draped with fly veils. That's how you can tell they're bushies. <laughs> The genteel interior of the Garden Palace was dedicated to the output of technology, the products of the consumer industrial revolution. While this included useful items such as ceramic pipes and galvanised iron, the marketing genius of the exhibition ensured that displays focused on personal and domestic consumer goods, the kind of thing that the citizens of New South Wales might long for in their own homes. The exhibition offered a vast marketing opportunity for enterprising manufacturers of personal domestic fancy goods, the kind of small luxuries that tempt uh, impulse buying. The objects shown here are all by Thomas Webb and the, Stun the Sons, uh, glassmakers of Starbridge near Birmingham. The firm specialised in etched glass and two-layer cameo glass. And there was a glass cutter actually in attendance every day demonstrating the, the craft you don't want to see it as mere industry, uh, and uh, personalising souvenirs. There are quite a few engraved glasses uh, floating around the place uh, from the, the exhibition with people's names uh, engraved on them. 
Webb and Son were enthusiastic international exhibition participants around the globe. They used their exhibition medal awards in advertising. They moved on from Sydney to the Melbourne exhibition in 1880, as did many ex uh, exhibitors, getting two ex uh, exhibitions for the price of transport to one. The development of industry was one of the central planks of the exhibition movement, and in the colonies, it fed a persistent idea that Australia would grow into an industrial manufacturing power following its British parent, and that exhibitions would facilitate the necessary technology transfer and design inspiration. But it never happened, thanks to the global economics of production and consumption, even in the 19th century. Here is an example of what was possible. Thorpe and David were not very memorable potters in the Camperdown uh, district. Their main product was ceramic drain pipes, but for the Sydney International Exhibition, they put on display their sideline of garden and architectural ceramics, uh, you know, the, the nicer, the more polite end of, uh, of utilitarian pottery, which I have to say is, is represented by Bendigo pottery. I couldn't find any pictures of uh, Davison and uh, Thorpe pottery. The brutal reality of all kinds of production in the colonies was economic. If materials, technology and labour made it cheaper to import them, then British and other foreign goods flooded in. If not, then colonial products could sell. That, that's why we have genuine colonial made uh, ceramic drain pipes. This is a lesson that, uh, that exhibition and subsequent museum advocates never learned. And Australian manufacturing industry for decades resisted the truth about our higher costs compared with lower cost manufacturing nations. The Great Exhibition and the Sydney International Exhibition have a lot to answer for, in fact, in propagating the idea that Australia could be a self-sufficient manufacturing nation like England. It preoccupied Australian governments until the 1960s They've, they're, they're, still, they're still struggling to keep up. Well, I think perhaps we've actually given up uh, at last in the, the last uh, few years, uh, stopping subsidies to uncompetitive manufacturers. Uh, that's, that's Australian capitalism for you. The vision of progress that the international exhibitions presented was grounded on industrial manufacture and the market trade that it supplied. But humans like to dress up the rationale of the good life as more than comfort and style. In the mid to late 19th century, the favoured concept was the goal of modern civilization, a new version of the glories of classical culture, informed by art, guided by good taste. This was the Victorian era idea of what the consumption of personal and domestic worldly goods would achieve. And we're still doing it via grand exhibitions. Here you have the, uh, what's now called the Royal Exhibition Building in Melbourne, uh, 1880s structure. Uh, today it houses exhibitions of uh, lifestyle, handmade design, craft beers, bridal expos, baby and child goodies, classic automobilia, I discovered, which is the very best in products and services to those who enjoy the motoring lifestyle. Truly, that's the program of the Melbourne Exhibition Building from now until December. So continuing traditional use of the heritage building, very correct practice. Modern trade exhibitions have a distinctly nostalgic, backward-looking edge, handmade tableware, craft-made beer, classic automobilia. And so did the Sydney International Exhibition, which contrasted the uh, achievements of colonial New South Wales with indigenous culture of the country represented in the ethnographic court. The style of display in all the courts was practically identical. Vitrines of specimens interspersed with uh, towering arrangements of objects. The sameness of display style has the unexpected effect of implying a certain equivalence of display content insofar as it's everything on display, on display to be gazed at uh, and uh, to, to be learned from, literally object lessons. 
the the lesson to be learned from the difference between the ethnographic court and the New South Wales half of the long nave there uh, was the progress of culture measured in material evidence. Uh, the one represents the primitive pole, the other indicates the pale of uh, the pole of progress, uh, a classic Victorian era dichotomy. On this spectrum, the Fiji court exhibits the simultaneity of indigenous primitivism and organised productivity generated by splendid British colonialism. From the significance of the same mode of display of different content, I want to end by illustrating the meanings of the same content in three different display modes. Look at these pianos and the hierarchy of exhibition that the newspaper illustrations depict. Up on the stage, a pair of top-end concert grands. Uh, this is two of the four German Bechstein grands that were exhibited. Uh, one of them is in the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences collection. In the centre of the Garden Palace nave in the British part of the building, a range of British manufactured pianos from grand to a large upright to a small upright cottage piano down to a harmonium. Here is the piano for every price bracket. And the bottom left, a Sydney-made cottage piano, which was cheapest of all because it didn't require transport on top of the other costs. So here we can see the piano for every household and every price bracket, which is the dream of civilization a la Sydney International Exhibition. The sequence demonstrates how industry was claimed and acclaimed as the agent of civilization, thanks to enabling the welcome of art into every home. The people of New South Wales became the latest in the world, whoops, <laughs> wrong one, the latest in the world to embrace the rhetorical aesthetic of the international exhibition. They really were thrilled to be showing how like England we can be. God save the Queen. <laughs>